Warren Buffett in the third quarter of this year actually added to his position in Paramount. And I find that very interesting because this is a name that I've been very interested in as of late. And so that's what I'm gonna cover in this video. So as you guys smash that like button, let me run that intro. What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. Let's dive right into this one because this one's very interesting. Paramount is a position that a lot of people don't hold, but it's an interesting name nonetheless. And so you can see from here in the third quarter, of course, everybody's well aware of Buffett's initiating position in Taiwan Semiconductor. I think that's a good play, especially considering that they own Apple or a large position in Apple. And so they do a lot of work with Taiwan Semi. And so it makes a lot of sense. Also, Taiwan Semi has a natural sort of like monopoly over the chip manufacturing space. I mean, they're not the only people that manufacture chips, but they largely are the only company that manufactures the most advanced chips. And so it's a good name to have in your portfolio. Notice that Buffett also continues to invest in oil with a large share purchase of Occidental Petroleum. This is a name that I have covered on the channel. And I did show you guys a really interesting way of entering in it using cash secured puts, utilizing Berkshire Hathaway's bull thesis on it. So that was cool. But the name that I want to focus on today, and I have it highlighted here, is that they increase their position in Paramount. And just note that as of the recording of this video, Paramount is actually down 40% on the year. Of course, it jumped a little bit. And I think part of the reason why that jump may have happened is because their third quarter results weren't as bad as people were expecting. And so let's get into it and you can see just on the front page of sort of like their earnings report that was released on november 2nd paramount actually added subscribers to their paramount plus service pluto tv remains the number one free ad supported tv streaming service in the u.s they did really well with smile which is now the studio's sixth number one film year to date. I actually watched Smile, it was a pretty good movie, and their affiliate and subscription revenue grew 6%. But let's dive into it and let's make sense of all of this. And so the first thing that you gotta pay attention to is how is Paramount Plus going? And so they're actually launching the service, or they have launched the service in France, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So it continues to get launched all over the world, which is good. And so that's gonna help to grow the service out. Notice that they're reporting in their new segments. And so the way that they're breaking out their segments is TV media, direct to consumer and film and entertainment. Once they provide their Q4 earnings, I'm gonna have the comparatives to forecast this company out using the new segment. So in this video, you're gonna see me forecasting it out using their old segmentation, but that'll change next quarter. But the thing that I want you guys to pay attention to is look at that direct to consumer segment. That's where Paramount Plus is. Notice that it's up 56% on a nine month ended basis and Three months ended, it's up 38% on the revenue line. That's very important, but I also want you guys to pay attention to the fact that profitability is declining. Year to date, their adjusted OIBDA, which is effectively adjusted EBITDA, is down 32%. And in the quarter, it was down less, it's down 23%. But just a point to note is that profitability is declining. Now, of course, that's gonna be a big reason why the valuation is continuing to get hammered in this environment. And you know, this is a ad spend type business. Uh, they do generate quite a bit of money from advertising revenues and advertising revenues are getting weaker as the economy is getting weaker. And so you could expect more pressure on the shares. There's no reason to sort of buy in at the moment. And if I didn't mention in the video already, I actually own a position in Paramount. So take anything that I say on this company with a grain of salt because I'm biased as hell. But you can see that direct to consumer is the segment that everybody's looking out for the most. And what I like about Paramount is that in their direct to consumer segment, I think this is the best part of the investment thesis in the company overall, because you don't care if free TV wins or if paid streaming wins. They own a leading platform in both. And so that's really good. Even Netflix free streaming service will not actually be free. It'll just be a lower monthly subscription type model. And so this is the true free TV model that they have with Pluto TV. But of course, when it's free and ad supported, it means of course it's ad supported. So you gotta watch out for advertising revenues declining. And I'll talk about that in a second. But first, let me just talk about Paramount Plus. It was the number one streaming service in the US in terms of signups and gross subscriber additions year to date, which is very important because other streaming services are losing people. Now let's get into that advertising revenue section. Notice that ad revs actually rose 4% year over year in the quarter. That's insane. And so last quarter, I was actually concerned about advertising slowing down, like we have seen with Meta and like we have seen with Alphabet, specifically YouTube. 
I still do expect to see an advertising decline with Paramount in future quarters. So that's a hot take. And the reason why I do feel like it could decline in future quarters is because remember in Q3, you also had that midterm election type spending, which is not going to occur in Q4. And so you could have worse comparatives now let's dive into the tv segment this is their largest segment for the business overall but it's also the segment that's most at risk so notice that paramount's family of cable networks continue to grow share year over year and they're growing in the key demo which is the 18 to 34 year old people and so that's really good but as I just said, advertising revenue declined 3% year over year in this segment. And they actually called it out specifically, which I'm glad they did. Increases from political advertising spending and pricing only partially offset the impact of lower impressions and foreign exchange. And so be careful guys, now that the midterm political ad spending is done, once again, I do expect much weaker comps in the final quarter. And I'm not really sure how many people have baked that into their numbers as they forecast out the valuation for Paramount. You really have to sort of like be in the know or just understand the business really well to sort of pick up on this fact. So pay attention to that. Ad spend is expected to decline in a weakening economy and you're gonna have weaker comps, especially in Q3 of next year, because Q3 of this year was propped up by political ad spending. So just keep that in mind. And so the biggest risk to the investment thesis is that Paramount is highly levered to this segment, the TV and media segment, which makes up 72% of their revenues. Now, remember guys, this segment continues to go away with continued core cutting. So buyer beware, this is not an easy investment. There's a reason why this company is trading very cheap and I wouldn't expect the faint of heart to be investing in this. And so once again, never take anything that I talk about on this channel as a recommendation to buy a stock. Everything has its risks and you have to make the decisions for yourself or if you're new, speak with your investment advisor. But now let's get into the financial statements because I wanna show you something very interesting that's happening in this environment. So notice this is their P&L for both the three months ended of the recent quarter and year to date. Notice that the profitability, so that's that operating income number divided by the revenues, the profitability or operating income as a percentage of revenues is 9.8% nine months ended in the current quarter and last year year to date it was 17.6 percent so as we're seeing profitability decline significantly year over year could we see cost restructurings i think we're probably going to see that so will they get rid of loss leading businesses well if they're non-core loss leading businesses maybe and we might even hear about some layoffs as well so pay attention to this I do predict that there's going to be some cost restructurings happening in the future. That's just a hot take. I don't know anything. It's just bold prediction based on how I'm seeing the financials play out now. And now notice this is the model that the Patreons get access to for Paramount. And if you want to access this model and all the other models that the Patreons get access to, you can access that at the lower tier of the Patreons, which is just five bucks a month. I give away all of my research for just about like a coffee or two per month. And so notice that in fiscal year 2017 to 2021, they had an operating profit margin of the mid teens to sort of like the low sort of 20% area like they did in 2018. However, in 2022, as I was building out my model, I actually forecasted their operating profit margins to decline to 9.5%. Now, I have to pat myself on the back here because my modeling was on point. I was forecasting 9.5% and thus far they've come in at 9.8%. I actually expect the fourth quarter to be challenging for them. So in fact, I actually think they're going to come just a little bit under 9.5% for the year, but I'll just continue modeling this out at 9.5% because they are a little bit over and I don't expect a recovery for the next couple of years. So you guys let me know how you guys think this should be modeled. Let me know if the operating profit margins are a little bit too low. I think a lot of people are modeling out higher profit margins, which is causing them to be more interested in the security than not. But because the fact that the security is down 40%, the opposite might also be happening where people might be a little bit too pessimistic in their modeling as well for profitability. So there's no right or wrong answer here. You guys let me know in the comments below what you think or what you guys are modeling out. Now, if you're not modeling anything out and you don't have anything to add there, no problem. Drop a meow in that chat anyways, just to help with the algorithm. Now, when it comes to forecasting out revenues, I'm sort of like pessimistic on overall revenue. I don't really know how to think about it yet. I'm waiting for their annual report to come out to sort of give me a better understanding of how to forecast it out. 
Currently, they're surpassing that 3% revenue growth overall, but I think weaker Q4 comps could bring us a little bit backwards into 2020, in 2022 to end the year off. And so I think a 3% overall revenue growth is reasonable. And then I'm not really forecasting out greater than 3% thereafter. Now, once again, I will build this out using their new segmentation once they release Q4 results. But once again, I'm not taking a position on any segment right now, but once I revise the model and I will let the Patreons know once I do revise the model, I will make sort of like a more granular estimate as I forecast revenue out. Now, just exactly what are they doing with their cash that they've been generating this year thus far? Well, notice that their net cash flow provided by operating activities for the nine months ended in September of 2022 was only $326 million. And so it's not a lot of money. And so they haven't really generated much free cash flow this year, but of the cash that they do have, they're using it to pay down debt. So notice that that repayment of debt number is $3.1 billion this year. And that leaves them with $3.4 billion at the end of this last quarter. And it's down from, you know, this time last year of $4.8 billion. Now, why are they focusing on paying down debt? Well, you can see that they still have $15.6 billion of long-term debt. And of course, you guys know that every valuation that I make I provide a excess capital calculation where if the company has excess capital, I will benefit their valuation for that. But if they have an excess amount of debt, in other words, negative capital, which is like what we have here, I will penalize their equity valuation for that amount. Because if I was to buy the business, the first thing I'm going to do is completely wipe out that debt. Now, some people can argue that most businesses can operate with a base level of debt. And so you don't necessarily need to wipe out all of it. So you don't have to penalize them that much for their debt. But I'm a little bit more conservative when it comes to my valuations and I'm okay with that. And so I'm happy to lose out on opportunities by being a little bit more conservative. That's totally fine with me. You guys let me know what you think. But all this comes down to what does the valuation look like? But before I show you the valuation, I just want to remind you guys that approximately 80% of the watch time on this channel is from people that are not subscribed. So if you have the opportunity, hit that subscribe button. Okay, now let's go right into the EPS valuation. And you can see that I'm actually valuing the company using a terminal multiple of 12.5 times earnings at $51.52 a share. But you can see that I'm penalizing them by $19 a share for that excess debt that they have, that long-term debt. So my EPS valuation or my equity valuation is $32 per share. If you compare that with the current share price of approximately 20 bucks or 1991, the company is not a super value right now. They're trading at 62% of its intrinsic value. So it's not in like the screaming buy territory. And I wouldn't be interested in this name until it was under $15 per share. But based on the current share price and where earnings are expected to come in at, it's giving you a current 11% equity yield. So it could be interesting to people who believe in the stability of the earnings. Now, how should the earnings or how do I expect the earnings to play out? Well, let's start with what the market is thinking first. Well, you can see here that the market expects an approximate double digit earnings yield, although it's a bit rocky into the next five years. So they expect a 10% earnings yield in 2022. It goes down a little bit in 2023, comes back up in 2024. And I guess in 2023, they're expecting a recession, which almost everybody's baking in right now. So that's why the earnings yield is a little bit lower. They expect a recovery in 2024. And then in 2025 and 2026, that's when earnings sort of take off. And so you could essentially generate a 20% equity earnings yield if you hold on to this name uh, for more than five years. But more importantly, what do I think it's going to look like? Well, I'm not really baking in as much rockiness from a recession in 2023 as most other people are. I sort of just forecast these things out linearly, try to come up with a perpetual valuation. And so based on what I'm seeing, this is completely uh, an investment, i.e. dividend share buyback type opportunity. The question is, is the business model sustainable over the long term? You can see here that my EPS is just gradually growing. In 2025, it grows a little bit faster because I expect profitability to increase a little bit more. And so notice that the EPS jumps from 2.42 in 2024 to 3.42. And so of course the equity yield, you look at the very bottom there, jumps from 12.2% to 17.2%. And then it gradually increases closing in on 30% by 2031. And so if this forecast is achieved, and that's a big if, I believe the equity value should increase from higher earnings to apply the current multiple on 
and a lower debt penalization, which is what I showed you earlier, as they will have paid back a large amount of that debt back with the earnings that they've been generating. And so this, of course, does not take into account the increased valuation multiple that the company would command once it's somewhat de-risked with lower amounts of debt as well. And so in my valuation, notice that I did give them a higher multiple. I gave them 12.5 times earnings compared to the 7.1 times earnings that they're currently trading at. And so I did give them a slight increase in that valuation, which helps with the valuation. But once again, it's not a screaming buy just yet. But know that the valuation could potentially be considered as somewhat optimistic because the company still faces the secular headwind, which is cord cutters. And so you really have to make a decision on this one whether or not you think that that risk is higher or lower than what the valuation is taking into account and so this might be too hard to predict for many of you and i completely understand that and so i totally understand if you guys decide to throw this in the too hard to value bucket it totally makes sense now there is one company that i recently did a video on that is a lot easier to value and i totally think of this company as a berkshire hathaway type business but it might just be too small for them to buy but it's not too small for us to buy and so the company that i'm talking about is h and r block and if you haven't seen my latest video on h and r block I think it's a great opportunity and it's a double digit equity yielding type opportunity. And so if you want to take a look at that video, you can get to it right here.